I think we've got about 20 minutes left. I'd be glad to, if it's okay with uh, Steve, I'd be glad to take questions. Yes? And by the way, while he's coming up, I am a public speaker. I do this professionally. If you've got groups or conferences or audiences, um, I've got a speaker sheet up there on the front table. I've got business cards. Um, feel free to contact me. My website's real easy, johnenglander.net. Um, yes, sir. Thank you, so, thank you so much for what you're doing. And you're right. It's a... <laughs> Nothing is ever simple. Nothing is ever just black and white. There's always a lot of different directions going on. And I just wanted to get your take because there's definitely, in addition to everything that you're saying, which is all valid, there is some experimental geoengineering going on. There is some weather manipulation going on, which is also affecting the issue, the actually manipulating and moving the jet stream. And there's military aspects where that's one of their goals, is to be able to weaponize weather. And so I think those are things that, we, that have to be not ignored. Okay, great, so thank you. Um, let me try and deal with that briefly. Uh, geoengineering, you probably heard of geoengineering. That would be an intentional manipulation of climate or, or the planet's systems, uh, engineering the, the geo geoscience and, you know, People say, am I in favor? I say, well, first of all, we've been doing it. We've not just like what you're alluding to, the, the jet stream and things like that, if that's true, but, but we, we are geoengineering by what we do, our lifestyles for the last couple, burning, taking fossil fuels out of the ground and burning them was geoengineering. We've been geoengineering this planet for a few centuries now. In fact, you can make the argument since we arrived, okay? We have been changing this planet's systems. Now the question is, can we, can we counteract the forces we've unleashed by intentional other efforts? And that's really risky, but you know what? We're gonna do it because as sea level rises and as we get this heat that's gonna affect crops and more drought, um, we can't stop in a, a countries from attempting geoengineering. Now there's lots of discussions and it's a really risky business. There've been ideas from putting uh, sulfuric acid up in the, in the troposphere to uh, uh, nurturing phytoplankton in the ocean, which might not be nearly so dangerous to um, putting sunglasses in space to reflect some of the sunlight. Uh, who knows? There, there have been big studies because the truth is because of the amount of climate change that is now locked in, that is unavoidable, we are going to try to do some things. It's like, you know, being overweight, you can exercise and change your diet or you can, you know, take pills and, and do different things. And some are probably healthy and some are probably not. And geoengineering is probably like that, but it's really risky because if we intentionally do something like reduce the amount of sunlight by putting filters out in space, which is one of the plans or reflectors, if we overdo it, we won't have enough energy, you know, and it, yeah. So, so geoengineering is a powerful subject. It's a concept, but I like to say to people, you know, we've been geoengineering, we are, geo we are geoengineering, okay? Let's be realistic here. Now, the, I do some talks with national security groups and they are concerned about this. And we can either be, um, you know, get into the uh, conspiracy or, or clandestine aspects of it, or the people I, that I deal with, and I, I do get asked to explain this more and more, actually are looking at it from a very honest and let's try and anticipate what's happening and understand some things and, you know, I'm not going to, I don't know the deep parts of the U.S. government or any other government what they're doing, but I know that even in Russia, that at the Security Council for the Kremlin, and we have a videotape of one of their meetings, which they actually, and it's, it, it was three or four years ago when they were having record heat waves in Moscow. Um, countries are really looking at this as a national security risk, okay, and they are trying to figure out what do we do when cities go underwater and we get more storms. I mean, there is no simple answer here, folks, and, and we want people in national security to be thinking about this. Now, getting into whether they're manipulating it, weaponizing it, um, you know, just like we are with cyberspace, that's a whole other discussion. I'm not disputing it, but I'm just saying, let's stay focused on this, that this is a big deal and we will do geoengineering. Yes, ma'am. Okay. A um, couple of things I want to address. Uh, first, I think this is not the top priority. Um, and I do think that doing small things like wind and solar 
and driving and, and a green lifestyle can have a large impact because we are a large number of people. Whereas the coastal line, that is a very small percentage of people that own property on the coast. Okay. Okay. Um, now, what I, um, I see with my own eyes is very easy to believe. I've been to China and I see the pollution. There's no doubt about it. Absolutely. China is putting up windmills everywhere. And solar. And solar. And doing things to counteract it. Yes, they are. Okay. I was in Hong Kong a yeah. few months ago. But as far as global warming, we've had the coldest winter we've ever had. In the it, eastern United States. Yes. If you turn on the TV. In, in this part of the in, world. In my lifetime, since when the very first day I've ever went to the beach in Daytona Beach, and I was just there in last April, the beach is even bigger. In my lifetime, I have seen no shoreline. Okay. Do you, I, you know, I'll be glad I to haven't, explain. I'll be glad I haven't to explain seen it. Yeah. Okay. Is there um, another point before I answer the questions? Uh, go ahead and answer those. Yeah. Do you have another question? Um, not at this moment. Okay. Thank you. So let me deal with both of them. Sure that we can affect things by going solar and being green and so on. And there are 7 billion of us headed to 10 billion. We should do that. But the point is still true that as greenhouse gases go for, or carbon dioxide from 400 parts per million to 900 parts per million, which they're projected to do, we have a big problem facing us. So that's one. As far as you're going to the beach and seeing that the beach is bigger, beaches move naturally. Okay. And when we put jetties in the water those, to get to marinas or change the coastline, we're trapping sand, okay? And there's different, we're interrupting the normal sand flow. When we built big, big buildings and, and assumed that we wanted a hotel on a, a great beach, we somehow were ignorant of the fact that over 20 or 30 years, the beaches tended to move. So we pump sand now, okay? And there are beaches that are getting bigger and some that are getting narrower. That's part of the ebb and flow of, of beaches. And it's, it's exacerbated by the jetties that are perpendicular and interrupt the sand flow. Some places get thicker and some places get thinner. You can't see sea level rise because in your lifetime, it's only been an inch of sea level rise. And compared to tide change and waves and everything else, it's imperceptible. So I hope that helps. I, I just have one more question. Okay. In my lifetime, I have noticed great um, fluctuations in temperature within one day. Sure. Like 20... That's called weather. Yes. But they're greater now than they have been in the past. Are okay. we studying that? Sure. And why are they greater? Well, as you warm the planet, the currents change, and the Gulf Streams moved and slowed down, and the jet streams changed, even naturally, regardless of whether we're manipulating it. And because of the, it'd be like putting a pot of water on a stove, cold water. As you turn up the heat, the patterns of, of convection change in the pot. Okay, you've all seen that. What's happening is that the currents are changing. So when we say, oh, look, we're getting more snow, and it's colder here in New York and New England than it's been for when I was growing up, well, yeah, but what about in the Arctic where it's 10 degrees warmer and the ice is melting faster? We tend to look at things very regionally and locally, okay? And there's great efforts. Next week, I'll be out in uh, Boulder, Colorado to the National Center for Atmospheric Research, which has been out there for 40 years and has samples and sampling systems that continuously monitor all over the world. And they're able to, in a standardized, objective manner, saying what's happening around the world, not anecdotally, why am I getting more heat here and more cold here or more rain here and more drought here, which leads us to this anecdotal type of evidence, which is frankly too subjective, okay? But we are doing that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the information provided. Uh, I'm a school teacher and I want to take this back to the classroom. Great. So we need to make two changes, as you said. We got to accept this and then we got to slow down the process. Right. What do I tell my students? Three things to help them slow down the, pro the process. Okay. Well, anything that reduces the amount of carbon dioxide we put up in the atmosphere, as well as other greenhouse gases, but anything that reduces carbon dioxide, which is going solar, uh, driving an electric vehicle, doing all of those things, being, making the house more energy efficient, all of that reduces carbon emissions. So those could be three things right there. The second thing they can do is we need to tell our elected officials because for some reason the elected members of our Congress are out of touch with the public on this issue. And it's happened before and it's pretty obvious why because 
there's a couple of hundred million dollars being thrown at them for their need to, to get reelected by some of the interests who don't want us to make changes. And just like the tobacco industry did 40 or 50 years ago. And uh, we need to tell our elected officials that we get climate change, we get sea level rise, and we want them to get it. And it's just that simple. And a kid can write the postcard and tell his parents about that. And, uh, and then, you know, find ways to educate others, whether it be their parents, their schools, their communities, because this is reality. And as I say, my daughter's 14. Um, I, I, in, in no way do I think she has a dismal future. I think she has a great opportunity to either help us cope with this, adapt to it, educate others, change policies. Um, that's what we need to do, just uh, like we do with other health issues. Telling my students to adopt or try plant-based diets, what are your thoughts about that? Well, certainly, certainly there's, there's, there's a good argument that, uh, you know, the, the cattle industry, or I guess, I think, I guess it's probably cows for both beef and milk, but um, I think it counts for 17% of the methane emissions in, in the United States. And um, certainly you, you can make a very good argument that if we would get off of cow-based, uh, you know, diets, that we would reduce the warming. But here's... And, and I, so those of you that believe that, that's fine, and I support it. But here's the reality, it's not gonna solve the problem. We should do it, but it's one of those seven steps or 12 steps, and that's the balance that I like to get. What I, what I think is a disservice is when we let people think that the answer is as if doing something like recycling or eating, going vegan is gonna solve the climate problem. That's wrong. Okay, so we need to do both again. And that's part of that education, which is really important. But certainly getting off cow-based agriculture, both beef and dairy, will reduce the warming, but it won't reverse it, okay? Thank you. Sure. Wait, I'm short. <laughs> Good morning. Hi. Thank you for opening our eyes and You're making welcome. us aware, and it's such a privilege to be here. I'm shrinking already. <laughs> no, you're broke. No, you've just grown in stature. <laughs> I've already shrunk three inches. Yeah. Okay, I'm. Uh, I live in Florida. I don't brag about it, but I'm originally a Bostonian. Okay. But we broke the record in 105 inches of snow. Mm -hmm. So about 10 years ago, or maybe 11 years ago, I got hurricane shutters. We haven't had a hurricane <laughs> since then. Yeah, which is a blessing. Right. It's wonderful. So I wonder if you have any uh, psychic abilities to no tell us. No psychic abilities, but uh, let me Do explain you, that. Okay, That's a great thank question. You. It gets to your question about weather variability and, and, and some of the other questions, and it's a really good question. Why do weather patterns change as the planet's warming? And you know, one, of, one of the big uh, dispute points that people say, well, how could the planet be warming if Antarctica is getting bigger? And what they're doing is showing a map of the sea ice around East Antarctica expanding. And it gets to why did Boston have more snow than usual in an era of warming? And this really does all tie together. Here's the simple fact. As you warm the oceans, and they're a degree and a half warmer, there's more evaporation. Evaporation puts moisture in the air. Moisture in the air is going to either come down as monsoon rains, which we're getting, and we've had record rainfalls here in South Florida. In Palm Beach, they had 17 inches last year in one day. It never happened before, okay? Um, we're getting record rainfalls in different places from the Philippines to, Boston, to uh, London, et cetera. Or if it's cold enough, we get record snowfall. Makes sense, right? Warming is not going to happen so quickly that there won't be any snow. And where there is more moisture in the air will come down as record snowfall. Entirely consistent with a warming ocean. Now, the other phenomenon that, ties, that hopefully ties this together for you and, and, and you is that, again, the currents change. We have what we call the Gulf Stream, which is the warm water coming up along Florida from the Gulf of Mexico around Florida and up across the top of the Atlantic to Europe. It's really part of a conveyor belt in the Atlantic Ocean that we call the Atlantic Meridional Overturning Current, the AMOC. And that co conveyor belt, if you think about it like that, which we only saw as the Gulf Stream, the warm water coming up the coast, is slowing and moving. It's moving position. And in fact, a recent paper just published a couple of months ago in a scientific journal attributed a four inch rise in sea level in 2010 off New England to a, a movement of, let's call it the Gulf Stream. 
Now, it was a temporary movement and it came back. But it's the kind of things that happen in the oceans that are really hard to perceive and seem counterintuitive with beaches being wider and so on, where you're really seeing a piece of the puzzle. But globally, again, you can now see a bigger picture. And the currents from the Atlantic to the Pacific, the El Nino, La Nina, these are fundamental changes to our weather patterns. As you warm the planet, the air currents, the jet stream, which they talk about the polar vortex, what that is is that's saying that for all of humanity or civilization or modern era, let's keep it simple, we've had the jet stream following a pattern in the winter and summer. The pattern's breaking down because we're warming the planet, so we're getting colder air coming further south because the, the clarity of the jet stream that goes from Alaska and Canada down across the northern United States and from west to east has been breaking up. So it's, why have we been 10 years without a hurricane and well, do we have to be in fear that it's going to, God forbid, be another Hurricane Andrew? Yeah, well, here's the reality, that we've had stable weather for 10,000 years when you look back at climate history. Now, climate's long-term weather, okay? It's like if you're in business, you may have a good day or a bad day, but you look at a year to get, you know, kind of how you're doing, right? You, a record day or a record bad day doesn't make your year. Well, weather's kind of the same thing with climate. I mean, we can look at patterns of climate of rainfall or drought, but we look at the, mo the longer the period, the clearer the, Im the impression. What happens is, and we did, we, 2004 and five, we had a record spate of hurricanes. We wouldn't be living in Florida if we had that continuum of, of progression of hurricanes. Since then, we haven't had any. But the patterns are changing. You know, how many times, how many times do you hear in the news these days, well, that's weird weather. That's weird weather. Hurricane Sandy, Hurricane Andrew, or weird weather. The drought in California is weird weather. Well, get used to it. Weather is going to be weird because we are at a warming planet is going to break out of the patterns of the past. Now, climate, the ice ages were weird weather on a 100,000 year scale, right? We wouldn't have affected us in a human lifetime. We thought that hurricanes were from June 1st to September 30th. Well, that got broken down a few years ago, right? We thought that, you know, you get this much rainfall in a year, that April showers bring May flowers. That, that determines agriculture and where we grow things. I hate to say it, but we've destabilized things. Get used to weird weather. It's one of the biggest problems with climate change. It's going to affect us in our growing, in our agriculture, and mold, and, and drought, and too much rain, and, and too much snow. And it really is a big problem, and, I'm, and thank you for making me articulate that, but it's absolutely true. The weather patterns that we grew up with, when the hurricane season is, how much rainfall, what month's rain, you're not going to be able to rely on them very much anymore. And it's not me or the weather forecaster or the weather models or the supercomputer models. They're going to try and do that. But the truth is this system is way too complex. It's like the human body. You can't predict everything. You may know what you put in has some effect. But we all know that it's too complex a system to know 100%, right? Well, the planet's even bigger. That doesn't stop us from learning some things. Thank you. We have seven minutes left, so a few more questions. Is that on? Um, the, I guess the easier question is, when I lived in Florida in the mid-2000s, afternoon rain was very predictable every single day for 15 minutes, 30 minutes. And now, as you say, the variability is it's, it's not there anymore. Uh, should I, is it worthwhile for me to put a well <laughs> for irrigation right now for my property and water? Yeah. Or, you know, uh, I, there, there is no good answer. I hate to, to okay. say that to you. All, all I, the only thing I can predict for sure is that sea level has to rise because in a warmer environment, the ice will get smaller, okay? And I'm not going back to my... my the, 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 the change of where we're going to get the precipitation and when is not possible to accurately predict. Models are trying to, but I'm basing mine upon two things, geologic history and physics, okay, about ice melting. Okay, it's a really simple thing. I'm not using models so much. Um, but your question's fair. What should we think about for weather patterns of precipitation in a given region? The truth is that's beyond confident prediction. But I think, you know, you can look to the last two or three years for changes in pattern and try and say maybe we'll get more of that. That's about all we know at the moment. Okay, my okay? second question is this. Um, 
I think the biggest way to affect change is really policy, you know, uh, because you affect whole society, yes. you know, by regulation or, or such, as opposed to, you know, a few of us recycling and doing okay. that, as, as, as you said. Uh, and I've called politicians or emailed them, and I've seen... If I you see, could shorten the question, we've got more people in five Okay, minutes. basically, I, what's the most effective way that you found to, to, to basically change these politicians' okay. opinions you because I contact, find you, okay. that they're really fixed in what okay. they believe? Okay, you should, you should write your congressman or, or leave a phone message, that works just well, or send an email. You should also join groups like Citizens Climate Lobby or 350.org or the um, next... Jen, uh, Tom Steyer's group, I can't think, but there's groups that are working together to, to, to aggregate political will to speak to politicians, and you should support them and participate. So if these email things work, then basically, you know, when you say it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a thing we can do, and okay. write, your, write your congressman directly. Thank you. Okay, next, thank you. Next question. There's two more, I think. Or, and then I'll be out there for book signing and also, um, um, oh, by the way, I, I should say, we've just started an institute an institute, this International Sea Level Institute, brand new, got a 501c3 status, literally opened the bank account Friday. Um, if you want to find out more about it, uh, it's, it's gonna be an effort to do more of this on a global level, uh, much more professionally and full-time than I just do it personally. Yes. Okay, so um, for the record, 40% of the world population is within 100 kilometers of a coastline. Okay. And President Nasheed, who was here in Florida last year, had to move 16 islands worth of residents because of the rising sea level. Okay. So for him, it's a genuine concern. Now, you talk about policy, and I totally agree with that, and I do meet with the political leaders, but I find them, especially the Republicans, who I aim my, most of my talks to, incredibly difficult to reach. So what statistic or what little piece of information um, can we give them that's sure. the most important that'll make the biggest difference? What have you found reaches them? Well, again, I don't talk about climate change at first. I really start with sea level. Okay. Because it sound, they're part and parcel of the same thing, as you now understand. But sea level and flooding property is a different issue and allows you to open the conversation. And even more and more in this, okay, well, sea level's rising or climate's changing, I don't know who's causing it. But once you get into it, like I think it's chapter six or seven in my book before I really start talking about carbon dioxide. Once you understand that sea level moves up and down 350 feet and that it is moving on what's at stake here, you, you actually start paying attention more to the climate potential and then the simple physics of carbon dioxide. If you start with that, and you know, we need to get off coal, and I'm concerned about climate change or global warming, you tend to get the resistance. But if you say, are you concerned that Miami is having to put pumps in where they didn't used to, that this is happening in neighborhoods all over the world? I say, oh yeah, well, we don't know who, what's causing it. And say, okay, well, let's just talk about the effect first, okay? And then if they get serious about it, and they realize that Miami's gonna go underwater, but it's not parts of Boston, and parts of San Francisco Harbor, and, and all over the world, from Manila to Monaco, and the Bahamas to Bangladesh, you know? I mean, literally, it's every coastal community in the world, and it's up tight. It's not on the coast like a storm if zone. Think of this, that sea level in, in South Florida doesn't hit Miami first. It actually hits west of the, out to the Everglades first, where it's really shallow or low. Okay, and so we, we get fooled. We tend to think it's like a storm where the waves hit. Not only does it get the lowlands and get, and, and a seawall won't matter because it's porous limestone, the water will get through the limestone and up behind a seawall, if there's limestone like in South Florida or the tropical islands where there's coral based. But on top of that, it goes up tidal rivers. Washington DC, Hartford, Connecticut, and Sacramento, California, and London, England are not on the ocean. They're all vulnerable to sea level rise as the ocean goes up, tidal rivers go up. The impact zone of sea level is far broader than a storm. So it's another way to get to people because they, don't, they haven't thought that through. My One more? My understanding is from what I've heard is that the Army Corps of Engineers in Florida is preparing for a three foot sea level rise by 2025. So I don't know if you've heard anything no, like that, but I've that's heard- That's not true. No, that's a misunderstanding. The Army Corps' last study came out in 2009. They're just revising it, but the 2009 study has been used by the four counties of South Florida that have worked together to, uh, to look at sea level rise projections uniformly, which is smart. So from the Florida Keys, um, uh, Monroe County, up to Palm Beach and D Dade and Broward in between, the four counties are using an Army Corps of Engineers study, but it says that by 2060, we will get between three and seven inches of sea level rise. By 2030, we could get a few inches, I, I think it's three to seven, by 2060, nine to 24 inches. And the new 
update they're gonna do within the next month or so is gonna look out to the end of the century and we think it'll be four or five feet, okay? So it's an increasing curve. One of the things is it's not linear. You, again, you, don't, you, don't, you only see an inch of sea level rise now which you can't see at the beach. It has no effect, okay? But we do know because of the ice melting that we are gonna get many feet of sea level rise in the latter part of the century and into the next. That's the reality that you just can't see physically. Yes, I think you're the last question. Yes, um, I was hoping that I could um, maybe get a videotape your answer to this and wanted to make sure that was okay. Sure. And um, if anyone, I'd like to uh, encourage anyone out there, you know, if you're on social media to, you know, spread the word and I've been using hashtag um, the real truth about health. That's how we get the word out there for all the messages. Thank you. And I noticed I'd, I'd that you are on Twitter. I, there's a Twitter is at John Englander, just my, my name, first and last name. My website is johnenglander.net, not .com, .net. There's a country music singer that has .com. Um, and uh, there is a Facebook page, so any of that's great. Thank you. Um, well, specifically, I wanted to find out about the state of Florida <laughs> and what our future holds. You had said about the rising um, water, and you were talking about Miami, but just in general, Florida, Florida real estate, um, you know. Um, yeah, this is, just, you know, it's a, it's a very valid question. Here's the two problems, well, three problems. We don't know how quickly the ice is going to melt, is, is true, okay? We don't know whether we're going to get, by the end of the century, three feet, six feet or nine feet. I do that because they're all equivalent to a, a meter in effect, okay? But, and that's true. We can't know because we don't know how the ice sheet will collapse. We don't know that because just like you can't predict an avalanche, okay? You know that the potential's there. You don't know how it's gonna collapse. Uh, but that's just fact. We're gonna, get, we're gonna get 10 feet. We just don't know, could be by the end of the century, but could be by the end of the next century, okay? Possible. And there's no way of forecasting that. It's not about lack of science or competence. You can't look at three miles of ice and know when it's going to collapse. If you're out in snow country and they said there's a risk of avalanche, it could be three minutes from now or three weeks from now that the avalanche happens. We understand that. There's no way of modeling that kind of snow dynamics, nor is there in Antarctica. So what could happen? Well, let's say we get four or five feet of sea level rise this century. It's not linear. It'll be, the worst part will be toward the end of the century. This is an accelerating curve. From your side, it's going to go like that, okay? And, and because it's an accelerating curve, it's like compounding interest, that as the decades go on, the effects get even worse, right? And that's what fools us, because when we go to the beach, like the earlier lady said there in green, that, you know, at, looking at the beach, the beach hasn't gotten smaller. In fact, her beach is getting bigger. Well, that's, that's fine. That's perfectly consistent. But we've only had, you know, two or three inches of sea level rise in her lifetime at most, and you can't see that in the ocean. And it has no effect on a beach because the beach changes more for the sand deposition or, or erosion, okay? But the fact is, the planet has enough ice to raise sea level up and down about, well, 200 feet now. And if you went back to the ice age part, the pre-ice age part, or when the ice age maximum, 600 feet. That's the total between the 400 feet we've already melted and the 200 feet that's remaining to be melted equivalent sea level rise from the ice. That's just geologic fact. So what does it mean for Florida, to your question about real estate? Well, in our lifetimes, it's just gonna be more and more days of flooding at peak high tides every 28 days or when a storm comes to town. If sea level raises things four inches or seven inches, it means the impact of that next storm or that next extreme tide is gonna be even more. So how much land will be submerged this century? We don't know. And if you're 80 years old and no kids or grandkids and you've got enough money and it's not, a, it's not a risk, fine. You just know that you're gonna get a few more days of flooding, but you know, not a big deal. If all of your investment are in that house in the Florida Keys or downtown Miami or, or some low-lying property, you know, and you are 40 years old or you got kids and grandkids that you're concerned about preserving equity for, here's the problem is that, and why you do need to think ahead that the value of real estate isn't because of where it is today. It's because if we perceive its permanence, we believe it's gonna be there forever, and we believe there's gonna be more and more need for land so the value will go up. Things are going to change and they are starting to change. I know of at least 10 cases where people have sold real estate in vulnerable areas in Florida 
and move to high ground in North Carolina or some other place and done it quietly, not told their neighbors why, because they didn't want to bring the market down. Because the value of real estate has to do with our anticipation of its future value. So the reduction of value of coastal real estate doesn't require that the land goes underwater yet. It requires that you perceive there's a risk of it happening within the next couple of decades. That's what's going to change in the coming decades and I nor anyone else can tell you when that's going to happen. That's like looking at the bubble bursting on property prices or stock prices or gold prices or anything else. It's a perception of future reality. But the difference here is that there is no person alive who can make an intelligent case that sea level will not rise, that ice will not melt in a planet that is one and a half degrees Fahrenheit warmer. So it's unique. Thank you very much. You've been a great audience. Thank you.